All right. So welcome to the uh, event for today, implementing budget-friendly video-based learning with uh, Ninja Tropic. I'm so excited, and it's a great opportunity for us as a chapter. This is actually our first vendor spotlight event for the year. And I think it is on my clock. It is 12 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. So today, basically, what we're doing is, you know, having this vendor spotlight with, you know, Ninja Tropic. We actually met myself and Daryl at uh, Salt Lake City during the international conference for ATD last year. And that's how we built a relationship. And we're here today. They're here to share a little bit about, you know, their product, their services, so we can all, you know, collectively as learning development professionals, learn from what they have to offer. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump right in. And you know, our focus for the year 2022 is a year of caring and capabilities. Obviously with video-based learning, that is one of the tools that as L&D professionals, you know, the way the trends are going in our industry, video-based learning is gonna be an important tool that you can add to your toolkit. Now, we're all, all of our programming for the year 2022 are going to be based off of the talent development capability model. So, you know, this is going to help you, Im, you know, improve your personal and professional capabilities. So without further ado, at this point, I am going to hand it off to Eric, who will kick off the uh, session this morning. Eric? Great. So my name is Eric. I'm the CEO of Ninja Tropic. And today I'm presenting with you with Darrell. He's a video learning advisor on the team. I'm firstly, I'm humbled and honored to be speaking with you guys. This is really cool to be interacting just because we're going to be at ATD Orlando. We're actually going to be sponsoring a good portion of the conference. And I strongly encourage you guys just to stop by. We do things very fun. We're going to actually have sketch artists. We're going to be raffling away a few iPads. And then also, it's always nice to, to meet in person. So I'm excited. And if you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to interrupt. It's a, it's a nice, comfortable group and we can wait till the end. You can put them in the chat. Uh, we wanna keep this conversational. So for the agenda today, briefly, I'm gonna talk about why video. Uh, I, I wanna keep this very direct just because a lot of our content is educational. So this session, I'm hoping you guys walk away with insight on the video learning process different types and applications of video, and then of course, how to prototype. Now, we are a unique vendor within the industry. We, we, have, we solve a very creative problem, but in reality, this process and a lot of the tools that I'm gonna be referencing can be applied either internally with your staff, uh, you can work with a freelancer depending on the scope of work, or of course, if you're finding an agency, you have a lot of options for video. So. The process conversations that Darrell will be having, very practical. The different applications, again, very insightful because it shows you what's possible with video. What's the language of video? And you know what to ask for after that conversation. Then of course, I'm gonna save questions for the end, but because it's relatively relatively tight group, if you're very excited about something, feel free to interrupt. None of us are gonna be uh, discouraged by that. So just jumping right into it, why video? And it was funny when I was putting this presentation together, I've chatted with numerous companies. There's a lot of data on the efficacy of video with respect to education. But honestly, from our perspective, it really ties to user experience. And what we've been seeing in the industry is this massive digital transformation where companies are updating their traditional SCORM compliant courses that are lasting an hour long or recorded webinar sessions that basically force people to sit through an hour of content to something a little more modern. So they're doing this in two ways. They're focusing on user experience by looking into different learning management systems, but then also the type of media and those go hand in hand. So we worked with Brandon Hall recently and they're industry consultants. They do a lot of different surveys and one of the key pieces of insight, which was very promising for the industry is that 85% of companies say that they're making an investment to video learning. And this just shows that, honestly, I would say that the industry is finally catching up. They're, they're seeing how practical YouTube is, right? They're, 
they're seeing that video sticking with their audience and then they're getting the positive lead metrics. When I say lead metrics, in terms of customer feedback with respect to online courses, completion rates, and then of course, uh, any other type of metrics that you can actually gather from your LMS, as well as lag metrics, the change in behavior that video has because people are actually paying attention to the content. So video is effective. And of course, we're really biased about that. I know that's gonna be obvious, but with that being said, it almost seems like an obvious thing. People prefer video. So who is Ingetropic? We're an e-learning animation studio for enterprises, associations, and universities. We started our company five years ago because I worked in the nonprofit space and I had a very ambitious boss. Uh, ML Peck, she oversaw product development and she wanted to develop a lot of animated training. And we wanted to compete with some venture back firms within the industry. But uh, when she sent me out to go and uh, collect a bunch of RFP, to set up an RFP, collect a bunch of different potential vendors for our, our big mission of producing 100 videos within the year, they essentially laughed at our budget just because we were, we were a nonprofit. They didn't necessarily have the funds and uh, we, were, we were in a bit of a challenge. So luckily it was a supply chain organization. And what we were able to do was develop a system that combined US-based freelancers with our production studio in San Salvador. So the great thing about this is a really good pair of instructional design techniques with uh, the cost effectiveness of nearshoring. Then from that specific case study, we were able to produce hundreds of videos, everyone was happy. And then I realized we had something special here that solved a big problem in the industry. And that's developing effective video that leverages cutting edge video learning science, right? How to make it effective for video. Then also doing so in a way that's customized to a brand. So it's not necessarily a cookie cutter video that looks and feels like it was created five, 10 years ago. It's something that's modern, contemporary, and refreshing to your guys' brand. Then lastly, doing it at a budget that allows companies to scale up production. So we work with a lot of companies that produce a lot of video. And then of course we work with some companies that produced just a handful of videos, but uh, most of our clients, it's it's something that they see the potential, they get excited about it, and then their their, their vision and standards change. So I'm gonna hand it off to Darrell just to go over a few key processes to follow if you're considering video, whether if it's with us or without us. Thank you, Eric. Um, as a business that's looking to create content, the first question you ask, have to ask yourself is, you know, where do you start? And really that first place is identifying goals and objectives. So for many businesses, those goals are going to fall into one to four categories, whether it's improving performance, uh, maybe it's financial, increasing your bottom line. Maybe you want to put together content that would allow you to monetize it or improving your brand. And in most cases, businesses are going to have more than one goal, um, usually two to three, if not all four. So once you establish those business goals, once they're determined, the next step is to identify and define the learning objectives and outcomes. And from there, you would then choose the content that's essential to your business and learners as well as the learning path. So in other words, how do you want that behavior to shift? How do you want to make sure that your employees are receiving uh, the best information possible and are able to retain the, the most information that's being, uh, that's being given to them as they possibly can? And then from there, we move to the animation process. And that would consist of, of course, the script, because that's the most important part of the process. Without a finalized script, um, you, you really don't have a video. So that's, that's a vital piece of the entire process. So it's the script, it's the concept style that's based on your business's brand, the colors, uh, uh, your, uh, your layout, um, how you present yourself as a, as a business and so on. Um, storyboard, 
is, is also a part of the process. And then, of course, the video production. So, you know, keep in mind that when you're working with a video production company, there's going to be opportunities for uh, flexibility and revisions in various stages of the process. Appreciate that, Drell. And what you will find about this process is it's it's very common within the industry. A lot of us have been involved in some type of storyboarding and some type of asset development in the video space. So it's important to go a step further beyond this, right? The process allows you to execute it, but really focusing on the pillars of video learning science allows you to do so in a manner that's effective for education. So a lot of things we like to focus on are principles tied to dual coding, right? Are we combining the right pair of visual and audio cues so people are retaining the proper information? What we've actually found while developing a lot of videos is when it comes to retention, having rapidly moving text aligned with audio doesn't necessarily align because people read at a slower rate than they listen. So usually what we try to push people to is to combine visual elements, graphics, charts, as well as uh, audio. And then of course, there's different practical uses of cognitive load theory. How much information are we releasing? What's essential with the video? Now there's, there's a lot of way to, ways to be creative, but honestly, sometimes it's not necessary and it could be a distraction with respect to content. And accessibility, accessibility is huge these days. This is actually becoming a, a larger priority and it, it goes beyond your traditional closed captions. What are you doing in your design process to incorporate color contrast, uh, font sizes? And then of course, how are you writing your script so it's it's accessible to your audience? Are you writing very technical content for an audience that has a fifth grade reading level? And the last component of our special secret sauce is learner motion. Are you incorporating storytellings to engage learners? So that's those are some of the key components of video learning that you guys have to consider. Now, if, when, you, when you guys are deciding to advance on your video, video learning path, there's a lot of different types of videos out there. I'm gonna walk you through how we started to categorize them. Cause we'll have clients that reach out to us and say, hey, look, we're looking to develop 2D videos uh, to specifically help with our training function here. And then I have to ask, like, why do you guys want 2D? Like, what, what's the purpose of this? What are you trying to achieve? So when you start your video learning journey, it always starts with the learning objective. What is the purpose of the video? So we broke it down to a handful of different popular categories in terms of purpose that could exist in different animation environments. So you have your purpose of the video, you have an animation environment, and that's 2D, 3D, screencast, or mixed media. And lastly, you have an art style. And let me walk you through what those look like. So, the purpose of a video, there's hundreds of different types of purposes you can have, but these are some of the most popular ones. People reach out to us with the intention of producing how-to videos. And this can be very simple. This can be a very mechanical oriented how-to video on setting up a manufacturing process. The video example you see right here is actually a 3D example where you need to see those visual elements because the mass matters. And then of course there's how-to videos on driver safety. And this particular client wanted to produce something that was a little more higher level focused, but not necessarily walking people through the details of an ATV, of a vehicle. So 2D was actually a, a relatively easy choice for them. But of course you have options like screencast. We need to show people how to use this application for this type of software. So all of them are actually a how-to video, but they exist in a different animated environment. And then you have advanced concept videos. These are videos that explain a very high level thought. It can be the integration of data servers uh, through segment universities, uh, cloud computing software. So very complex topic that the audience like needed a visual to see and understand what was happening. 
It can be an infographic-based animation tied to the Red Cross on substance abuse scattered throughout portions of Europe. Again, having these visual cues that really express the gravity of the situation essentially sells the idea. Then you can even have advanced concept videos for manufacturing-based concepts, especially when you're not necessarily addressing a very specific uh, like mechanical component. This is an interesting purpose of a video because it's, it's kind of a weird category just because it's very oriented towards people. A lot of our clients, they'll come with videos on, okay, we need to show people how to do something. We need to explain these concepts. We need to make sure that they're able to do X, Y, Z, but we want to highlight people at our company. So this actually almost has its own category within our company where we're highlighting subject matter expert. And all of these examples, whether if it's a 2D animation, a 3D animation, or actually mixed media, which is live action combined with animation, are very effective forms. We had Autodesk produce sales training that incorporated a, an actual live action character. We've had industrial-based clients that wanted a 3D realistic person. And then of course, Dale Carney wanted to produce live action videos with animation but highlight their industry experts. You have scenarios based videos that simply describe a situation that's happening so people can really understand the gravity, gra the gravity of, a certain, of a situation. Or you can have something a little more medical based that exists in the 3D realm. So what I'm hoping to show you guys here is there's a lot of different types of animation environments and they apply to different types of purposes in the video. And lastly, storytelling. What we have seen in the industry so far is 2D animation lends itself very well to storytelling, just because it's really focused on high level concepts. You don't necessarily need a lot of detail and there's a lot of visual elements that can easily be incorporated to this. So as you see, Starting with the purpose is key. You identify your learning objective, you break it down to a simple purpose, and then you'll have a better idea of what type of an animation environment is necessary. With, we've produced thousands of videos per year. It's, we have a lot of clients that produce a lot of videos and a majority of them are actually leaning towards the 2D animation space, just because it's a good combination of feasibility and flexibility with respect to style. We have a lot of industrial-based clients that produce 3D videos, software tech companies that are very screencast heavy, and then mixed media companies, but a majority of our work is our 2D animation. There's one last component. So we broke it down by purpose. Now you've seen that there's a difference between 2D, 3D, 3D screencast and mixed media. And for 2D, there's actually different variations of art style. So 2D animation, it's a broad category. You have frame by frame 2D animation, which not very common in the industry. We've produced a dozen videos like this this past year where the client needed to see a high level of detail in terms of lip sync and rotation of the head. And it's, it's amazing because one minute of 2D frame by frame takes a substantial amount of time. It's actually yeah, within 50 to 60 hours. So we didn't make this, this is The Simpsons if you recognize the doctor. Motion graphics is actually very common in the learning space just because it's a really good combination of graphic design and motion, which allows for some character movement, some lip sync, but it really ties in the higher level story structure. And then of course there's template based animation software out there as well. Uh, you have your Vions, your Powtoons, your Crazy Tux, which we, we've done a handful of projects with those. What typically happens with Vion or the reason why we, we jump on them is sometimes our clients start a Vion project, they'll put an instructional designer or somebody with a, a master's in education and give them the software and have them ask them to produce a lot of videos and then uh, they, it's still an animation software, right? So you still have to have that creative insight. You still need to understand uh, different types of video editing and story structure. So Usually when we're doing a Vion project, it's because somebody started a project, 
they were overwhelmed, they didn't want to finish, and they thought it was a little, a little more cost effective to do it with us. Uh, really cool softwares out there. Tying into the, the, the process that Darrell mentioned from script, storyboard, to creating assets and animation, what these softwares do is it allows you to skip the creating assets phase because you essentially have a bank of assets, characters, environments to work with. You still have to script it, you still have to storyboard it, and you're still going to be animating. So it's one thing to keep in mind uh, when, when you're looking at some of those options. Now, I've talked about 2D animation. Lastly, I want to jump into art styles. So this really depends on your guys' brand, the aesthetic. This is really like what kind of details are we going to incorporate? And what I'm going to do is there's a link right here at the bottom. I can send it to you guys, or you can reach out to our website, email us. I'll have our emails at the end of the call where we can send you a mood board of different styles, different art. That exist, but we've broken down into three different categories just to keep it simple. We have a corporate vector design, which is essentially compiled by putting shapes together in Illustrator. And this is very common with our corporate based clients that don't necessarily need a lot of detail in their video. We have character lecture based videos that are very people intensive. And here are a few good examples of the different art styles. And then, of course, we have whiteboard illustrative examples. So you broke down your purpose of the video. You wanna create how-to videos on XYZ. You realize, okay, great. This goes very well with 2D animation and we wanna simplify it, just stick with motion graphics. The last step is, great, what art style are we going for? Do we want something that's a little more corporate, a little more illustrative to express emotion or something that's going to involve specific characters? This is, uh, sometimes this is this process in terms of de determining a style is pretty easy. There's four components that you guys have to consider. What is it, what is your existing style guide saying? This might involve bringing in somebody from marketing or using an existing brand book or style guide that you guys have. This can make the question, the, the, the answer to that question very simple, right? What options are out there? What can we use? What does the brand book say? The next thing is learner resonance. How will the learners respond to this type of content? Like, will they take this type of tone and art style seriously? Now, animation, people tend to think, oh, it's for children. And this is where art style makes a big difference because if you have a very serious art style with, with more of a, a serious tone, it changes that perception. You have project sponsors. What does your boss say? How is he or she going to react with this type of art style? And honestly, that's one of the biggest sides of this coin. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of building a prototype that gets everyone involved in this in terms of approval. Because once you have that initial video, you'll see, great, this is how the learners respond. And this is the type of feedback that I have. Yes, it's in line with our style guide. And then, of course, our project sponsors like the concept. This is something that they're proud of. And the last equation is, what does your budget allow for? Right? It's, it's, it's an important part to see what the potential is. So when you guys are ready to advance and you're curious about the video process, the last thing I want to encourage you to do is develop a prototype. And this is essentially like a one-off micro learning course that you can test with your learners, you can test with your project sponsors, and you actually gather a lot of information in terms of budgeting details. It shows you not just what it costs in terms of hours, either if you're doing it or if you're working with a vendor or a freelancer, but it, it really breaks down what's a time requirement on your guys' part. Uh, Darrell and I were talking to one of our potential prospects yesterday, and they were, she was actually having that conversation. Okay, great. If I were to develop something like this, what would it take versus me working with somebody external because she's 100% focused on content where it's going to be a little bit tricky, especially throughout the year. So what does developing a prototype look like? Honestly, very simple process. First, discover and adapt your goals. What are your goals for the learning modules? 
Like, what are you trying to achieve with respect to business? And what's one learning objective that you can create a video on? And then from there, follow the video process to create a prototype and production plan. What are some of the assumptions that you're checking? Once you produce a prototype, you have to get your feedback. Give this to your learners, have them go through the content, compare it to your past learning experiences, and then of course, send it to your project sponsors to say, hey, look, this is what we're trying to do, and th these are the costs, right? This is what we're doing in terms of timing. The benefit about this approach is it's an iterative method for you guys to get feedback and really make sure you're developing something that resonates with your audience. And lastly, once you get that approval, if people are excited, you can scale up production. So um, again, I'm hoping that you found these processes very useful. We are an asset in terms of making video production easy, but there's a lot of things you guys can be doing here on your own as instructional designers and learning professionals. Then of course, if we can make it easier, if we can save you guys time or money, that's what you're here for. So I'm gonna open up the floor for some questions. I haven't seen if anything has come in. And then uh, I'm also going to leave up our contact information while we chat about this. So do you guys have any questions? Yes, I see we had a question from uh, Michael in the uh, chat. So Michael, if you wanted to uh, unmute yourself and uh, maybe come on camera if you can. So my question was, what, what would be a good platform to get started with um, in the early stages would you recommend to start learning? That's, that's a really good question, Michael. And firstly, I love how this Zoom webinar is actually just more of a meeting too. So it's a really cool concept and I hope, I'm hoping that I don't put you guys on the spot too much with, with these questions. But uh, I am a big fan of Beyond. It's, they have a, a very nice free, like freemium model where you can sign up, you can actually start experimenting with video production and it actually shows you what the potential is. Uh, Camtasia is very useful if you're developing software based videos, but if, if you're doing something that is a little more animation based, Beyond is a good test vehicle. It shows you, hey, look, this is what the potential is. This is what the process is like. And this is how I could be potentially spending my time developing the videos. So those are those are the go-to. Now, if you, it depends on your background as well. So let's just, we're, we're seeing in the industry that instructional designers or developers, they have two backgrounds, right? An educational background or more of the design oriented background. Or actually for the, a third of the industry, they were just, uh, they kind of just fell into the instructional design space, which I'm, I'm sure you guys have chatted with people about, but uh, if you're more of a designer, I would really consider Adobe Suite products just because you have everything from Premiere to After Effects. But again, this is what professionals use. This is, this is a little more complicated. So if you don't have that design background, um, Camtasia and Viander are awesome platforms to start with. Thank you so much. All right, do you, any more questions? If you have questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself. I do have one question for either Eric or Daryl. Um, you guys, uh, the tag was implementing budget-friendly, you know, video-based learning. So as far as costing, so what would be, let's say we just have one small project, what is the average cost of your projects? I know it's difficult to say, but, you know, compared to the other tools out there, what makes your product more cost effective or more budget friendly compared to, you know, say a Beyond or, you know, one of the other products out there? Cool. All right, I can jump onto that one. So we have a range of different art styles that the, the, the best answer I can give you, it's going to be a very general one, but then I'll give you a specific dollar amount, is it depends on the art style and the volume. So a lot of our clients, and the reason why we're, we're a little more budget friendly is because we're designed for a lot of content. So what we'll do with our clients is once we develop the prototype, we give them a ballpark range beforehand and 
once we have that volume, we can apply certain volume discounts. But with that being said, a very average cost that includes end-to-end -end production is uh, a minute rate of 550, so 550 dollars per minute, and that includes storyboarding, asset development that's unique to you guys, voiceover, and uh, the entire animation process. So what's great about that is, uh, like that's essentially the amount of time it takes to develop a video, and it's it's what we have seen is before Digitropic. The industry, especially a lot of the more established agencies, where they would charge you two to three grand a minute. So, what we're hoping to do is make this a lot more accessible and scalable, especially if, in terms of uh, micro learning. All right, thank you so much. That was a great uh, response, and at least gives more clarity on you know cost and at least some foundation that one could build on. All right, so any other questions from the audience? I hear crickets. Perfect. Yeah, if you guys, if anything comes up, guys, I'm going to put our emails and a few links in the chat where we, we try to take a very consultative approach to everything that we do. So anything comes up, please reach out. And <clears throat> I'm including a link to our resources page. The cool thing about this is we have two really cool tools for the industry. One of them is a micro learning video timer, which if you're trying to figure out what is the ideal length for a video, it provides you some resources there in terms of timing on how to time your script, as well as robot voices that you can download for free just to test it out. And then we have a um, video ADA color checker that allows you to test different color contrasts, contrasts on, on your design. So, it gives you the chance to check the accessibility of videos before you actually start producing a certain style. All right, I don't see any questions, so go ahead and um, continue sharing. So once again, on behalf of ATD Central Florida, we definitely want to give a big thanks to um, Ninja Tropic, to Eric Prospero, and to Daryl for you know this uh, presentation. It's been very insightful. I've learned quite a bit myself. And, you know, I think a few things that I could also take back to my employer and share, because I know we do a lot of video-based learning and see if that's something they'd be interested in. But um, yeah, I think it was a really great presentation and we are definitely looking forward to meeting with you guys, you know, in person during the uh, international conference coming up in May. So at, that, at this point, um, if there are no further questions, just a few things that we just want to sh talk about before we wrap it up. Uh, for the members uh, of our chapter who are on the call, uh, you know, there's a benefit for being a power member. So if you're currently a chapter member, um, as always, having national and local chapter membership is important because you get the benefit of, you know, both resources. You can tap into the resources we provide locally and also the resources that are provided by ATD National. All right, so moving on, um, we are also looking for volunteers. There are a couple of slots that are available on our board. We're looking for people to help out with membership. We're also looking for our director of communications. So if there's anyone in the uh, audience that you know is looking at volunteering, please reach out to me directly. We'd be more than happy to get you uh, join our board so that you can be um, a part of the uh, volunteer work that we're doing, you know, within the Central Florida community. So on that note, we are at the end of the session. Again, a big thank you to Eric and Daryl for, you know, taking time to be with us today. If there are no questions, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, Janet, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we wrap this up? I know Janet is in the audience. Thank you so much, guys. I'll tell you what, I really picked up some great things from that. And uh, I appreciate the fact that it looks like you have a range of offerings from uh, folks who are more advanced in this particular area. Uh, 
as well as people who might just be getting started for the first time putting this together. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you. I really, really picked up some great things and I'll be sure to spread the word. Thanks so much for joining us today. So I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I just want to say thank you guys. It's uh, it's exciting to be able to present to you guys. Really liked the uh, the interaction we've had today. And again, please stop by our booth in Orlando. We'll make sure it's fun. And we're hoping to continue this conversation collaboration going forward. So thanks again, everyone. Yeah, to echo Eric's sentiments, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And we will see you in Orlando.